Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to the first in this year's Research Group on Constitutional Studies Lecture Series. The RGCS Lecture <coughs> Series in Debate, supported by a generous gift to McGill from the Aurea Foundation, aims to bring leading researchers who work especially near the boundaries of disciplines in the human sciences, in philosophy, history, and law, and the social sciences, to present their research in an accessible way to bring questions about the values, principles, and institutions of a free society into the heart of student intellectual life at McGill. The RGCS Lecture Series now entering its fourth year will have three events this semester, the next of them two weeks from now and the following one two weeks after that, and then two in the winter, the full schedule of which are available online under the Research Group on Constitutional Studies. RGCS brings together faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates from especially political theory, political philosophy, and public law, but also from other areas of the social sciences, from legal philosophy, and other areas of legal studies, to investigate, again, questions about the match between institutions and political ideals and norms, and to create a live research community at the intersection of those fields. RGCS is, as of this week, a, a component unit of the newly founded Yan P. Lin Center for the Study of Freedom and Global Orders in the Ancient and Modern Worlds, a center that will bring together a broader range of disciplines and subdisciplines, broadly in the normative, historical, and comparative areas of social inquiry, the humanistic social sciences across three faculties to study comparisons across eras and across regions, again, for the study of values and institutions and principles across societies of a variety of different kinds. We're very lucky to have <coughs> with us to give the first lecture of the year, Laura Weldon, who is Distinguished Professor of Political Science at Purdue University. She's received her PhD from the University of Pittsburgh, where she won the Lawrence Cabot Howard Award for scholarly excellence and commitment to social justice. Professor Weldon is the founding director of Purdue's Center for Research on Diversity and Inclusion, and she has served Purdue as interim vice provost for faculty affairs and as acting provost. She's the author of more than two dozen articles and book chapters, as well as two books, When Protest Makes Policy, How Social Movements Represent Disadvantaged Groups, published by the University of Michigan Press, and Protest, Policy, and the Problem of Violence Against Women, published by the University of Pittsburgh Press. Protest, Policy, and the Problem of Violence Against Women won the Victoria Schuck Award from the American Political Science Association for the best book on the study of gender and politics. She is the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook on Politics and Gender. She's the founding co-editor of the new journal, Politics, Groups, and Identities, past president of the Women in Politics Research Section of the APSA, and a member of the Council of the APSA. She is president-elect of the <coughs> Women's Caucus of the APSA, and was awarded the, Victor the Violet Haas Award by Purdue for promoting women in the university and beyond. This semester, we're lucky to have her with us at McGill, where she is an O'Brien Fellow in the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism in the Faculty of Law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Laurel Weldon. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob, for that nice introduction. And thank you for arranging this um, lecture. Thank you to all the colleagues who have taken time out of their busy schedules today, and I know it's an especially grueling day for the group on constitutional studies who have done a couple of other events today as well, so I, I appreciate your perseverance and hope uh, you find it worth it. And thanks as well to the students and others who have um, come out to hear me today. I hope I'm looking forward to talking with you about this um, research. 
the research that I'm going to present today is uh, part of a collaborative project that I've been working on with Mala Tun, who's at the University of New Mexico, although we've been working at it for such a long time that she's switched institutions and we've had uh, three, four babies between the two of us, just one for me and three for her, but um, <laughs> lots of stuff has happened. But anyway, so this project is called The Logic of Gender Justice, a Global Analysis of, of Women's Rights. Um, and I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to try and do, although I don't know, if you, I hope you can see this, but anyway, um, apparently we've got the waning days of this projector, it's on its last legs, so we're going to, hopefully it doesn't croak in the middle of our presentation, so, um, but, uh, so the, the, what I'm going to try and um, tell you today is that uh, uh, gender justice is multidimensional, and um, just to be a bit more, tell you a bit more what that means, and I hope you'll know what that means by the end of the presentation, if you don't know what it means right now. Um, is to say that the political dynamics of different gender politics, of different politics of different gender areas, they vary by issue. Um, and so I'll show you a two-by-two two table which allows me to, this is very political science-y, uh, which allows me to d distinguish four different types of gender issues and then explain four different types of political processes that produce these different kinds of outcomes. Um, so, uh, just to give you a taste of where I'm going to be hoping to go, um, for one of these kinds of issues, issues that um, we call status issues, it's feminist movements and the global norms they create that drive policy making in this area. In other areas, institutions sedimenting group struggles, um, class struggles, uh, religious struggles, ethnic struggles, more fundamentally shape change, enabling and blocking movements and parties as they, sh as they seek uh, justice, as, as they seek equality. Um, so I'm going to try and show you exactly what that means as we go along. And I also just wanted to flag that gender justice here is a very broad concept, and today I'm going to be focusing on one slice of gender justice, and that is the slice that focuses on women's rights and sex equality, and I can explain more about the relationship between those um, concepts in the uh, in discussion if possible. So the study that I'm talking about today is a global study, and by that um, I mean that it draws, on, it draws on data on 70 different countries. These countries collectively cover 85% of the world's population, um, and we have data on them for the period from 1975 to 2005. It's an original data set that we created. Um, we're stopping at about eight issue areas. We originally wanted to do more, um, but uh, we're, after all these years, I think we're going to stop at the eight, but anyway. There are eight different issue areas. I'll tell you what they are, um, and I'll come back to more maps where I'll show you what the variations are. But before we get to do that, I want to tell you why did we do this crazy, ambitious study to look at all these different countries and all these different areas? What got us doing this? Well, we were you know, talking together and puzzling through some puzzles of women's rights that we felt like we didn't have the answer to when we first started talking about this. So one thing, so I studied violence against women and um, Mala studied family law. So we had a lot of tussles because these areas are quite different. So one of the things that happened was we were quite confident in our understanding of our issue areas, but we ended up finding that we didn't agree when we talked about specific examples. So let me give you some examples of things that we would talk with each other about. So. Governments that are progressive in one area on women's rights are not always progressive in other areas. Now, um, so for example, one of the ones that I kept coming back to was the Nordic countries, the women-friendly welfare states of Northern Europe, which, you know, people, I was just in Sweden this summer with a bunch of political scientists who were constantly saying, oh, of course this is happening in Sweden, and Sweden is so wonderful, and everything's great in Sweden, and things are pretty good in Sweden, I do have to say. But, um, but one of the things that isn't so great is that Sweden and a lot of these Nordic countries were very slow to address violence against women in cross-national comparative context. So our own Canada um, and the United States, Australia, um, were much earlier to address violence against women and more expansive in their um, actions on violence against women than were the so-called women-friendly welfare states of Northern Europe. They were first, of course, to innovate in areas like daddy leave and so on. So you know, what we really see here, it's not that one country is woman-friendly and one other country is not, but rather that there's, um, you know, uh, variation according to what issue you're talking about. Um, so that's one thing. Well, why? Why is there that variation and why daddy leave in Norway and violence against women in Canada? Why? Um, richer countries are not always more progressive than poorer countries. And I'll give you a nice, remind me, I'll definitely give you a little point on this later, which is that, you know, you think the countries of uh, the established democracies, the wealthy countries of, of Europe are going to be far more um, uh, advanced on women's rights than, say, the countries of Latin America, right? No, not so. Not so in um, the area of violence against women. In the 1990s, 
Brazil and Argentina were adopting innovative policies in violence against women. And every time I say this, I remember interviewing this woman at the UN um, when I was doing my dissertation work who said, oh, the Latin Americans just think they're the cot's pajamas when it comes to violence against women. They're doing all these, you know, exciting, innovative things, you know. And the European countries really weren't. So um, Finland and Italy and Spain in particular um, were not especially uh, progressive. Um, and also, variation within regions is another thing that's kind of puzzling about this area. Region, religion, and what in comparative social policy sometimes gets called families of nations. And that's kind of like loose groupings of countries that sometimes vary together. That's sort of a concept some people use. Um, so for example, Turkey and Morocco overhaul family law. Saudi Arabia does not. Uh, Iran and Indonesia introduce greater sex inequality, more inequality over the same period. What's going on? These are all predominantly Muslim nations. Why do some change their family law to make it more egalitarian, keep it the same, make it worse? Why? This is a puzzle. It doesn't help us to say they're Muslim states, right? There's lots of variation. Similarly, um, if we look at Italy and Ireland, both are predominantly Catholic nations. Um, Ireland is the only country in the developed world to have strengthened oppositions to abortion, entrenching them in the Constitution. Italy, fully funded legal abortion, is available in Italy, a predominantly Catholic nation. So what is going on? Okay. Am I blasting your doors off with my loud voice? No, okay. All right. So, why these differences? What um, explains these patterns? Well, as I said, it's a bit of a trick question. These are feminist clown images. Um, there is no single explanatory factor, right? And you are all too sophisticated to think there would be anyway. There are no easy answers. But I want to point something out about the fact that there's cross-issue differences in a single polity. I just want to draw your attention to something about that. What that means is that no single feature of the national polity is going to explain these outcomes, right? So you can't say, oh, it's modernization, right? Because why would that be true for daddy leave but not violence? It's not going to be women in government because, again, it's the same portion, it's the same legislature that's acting on daddy leave and not acting on violence or vice versa. So um, it's not one model for gender equality. It's not democracy. It can't be one thing. So we have to start be thinking in a more nuanced way about these models. Um, again, it's not also just it's also not patriarchy, but yada yada, you get the idea, right? No one model, no one thing. Um, in fact, what it really suggests is that gender equality, we think, this is how we're, where we're getting into, is multidimensional. There's more than one aspect of gender equality for us to think about, and what we really need to do is disaggregate gender equality into a series of different issues or dimensions. Um, these dimensions are defined by underlying social axes. So we suggest that um, we start by theorizing the underlying dimensions of class uh, and of religion in particular, um, and you'll see how religion and nation end up getting uh, intertwined in the our story. Um, but the thing I wanted to say about multidimensionality is that we have, once we distinguish dimensions, we have to ask about what is the relationship among these dimensions, right? So they may not be related to each other in any simple fashion. So, you know, you don't necessarily assume that, okay, well, we just add all the dimensions up and we get gender equality. It's possible that they are related to each other in more complicated ways. Maybe they're unrelated. Maybe they're inversely related, right? More class, more on, more on class means less on something else, right? So um, we just want to think about that. So just to kind of give you some visuals to think about multidimensionality, and it, given the darkness, I'm not sure that they'll be that helpful, but, you know, you can think about different planes intersecting or... Um, one thing, this is a good visual if you could see it, which is that you can kind of tell that if you go out one dimension, you could be going in the opposite dimension direction, you could be going down, you can be going lots of different ways on another dimension. It doesn't necessarily tell you, uh, and this is kind of a crazy, but, so yeah, this is also just, you know, this is how complex things are, right? Two by two table, this is a three dimensional space, pretty com complicated once we start talking about three dimensions and um, so, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that this is all complicated. The thing that I want to say is that we're trying to define these dimensions as they turn on relationships to key institutions and identities. Um, and how the equality initiatives that we're talking about, how these gender justice initiatives relate um, to dominant institutions determines which actors and which um, contexts are relevant for a particular type of issue. Movements, of course, contest these relationships, and they become important for that reason as well. And so um, we're not just saying, well, there's lots of dimensions and it's pretty complicated. <laughs> At least I hope we're not. Right? We're trying to say why we see the patterns. So I hope by the end of this talk, you'll understand why it is that we see daddy leave in, in Northern Europe and violence against women in the um, US and Canada, for example, as, a, as um, 
being innovative in that way. We hope you'll understand why it is that there's this difference between Ireland and Italy. And if for somehow I get lost and I forget to tell you, please ask me. Okay. So, so here's the typology I was telling you about. So this is like a framework, really, um, that helps us understand policy issues. So the two different dimensions that we really are looking at um, is, first of all, whether a policy is doctrinal. Um, now, what do we mean by that? How does this equality initiative challenge, does it challenge the um, established doctrine of the dominant religion, right? Does, is, so that tells us if the policy, now this is going to vary from context to context, right? So not the, what, a policy that's doctrinal in one case might not be um, doctrinal in another. So abortion, for example, not especially doctrinal in India. Nobody cares about it very much. Um, I shouldn't say nobody cares about it very much, but you know what I'm trying to say. It's not the same kind of salient issue that it is in other places where it really is an important um, issue. So doctrinal issues are defined by how they relate to the dominant religion's uh, codified doctrine. Um, uh, class issues are determined by their relationship to the market. How do they, how do they affect class inequalities among women? How do they affect uh, these um, relationships between women in the market? And in this particular case, one of the things I want to point out is that all of these four issues are gender issues. So we're not saying some of these issues are gender issues, some of them are class issues. They're all gender issues. But some of them touch primarily on these questions of religion and some touch primarily on issues of class. So, um, so um, and this funding for contraception and abortion is an example that we're giving of an issue that t does both, right? So there's four different groups here. Um, so why is this a useful way of thinking? Well. For these, for these issues that are in this, um, this category right here, these status issues, really, in some ways, um, autonomous feminist organizing and these kinds of global norms that they create drive policy making in this area. What's critical here is that these are about changing um, legal official um, policy understandings of uh, women's status, of women's importance. And they depend on, especially when they depend on um, having a particular issue articulated outside the, that isn't a regular issue, right? Something that is obviously stemming from uh, other concerns. Particularly for those issues, autonomous feminist organizing is going to be important. So to just give you the violence against women example, you know, this is an issue that is um, not coming up in the regular run of things, right? So you know, as you're wor working in the Department of Labor, you're not necessarily coming up with issues of violence against women. As you're working in the Department of Agriculture, you're not necessarily coming up with violence against women. These are the kinds of things where um, these issues are not coming up in the regular run of politics, where autonomous feminist organizing is particularly important. Um, these um, autonomous feminist movements work with women's policy machineries and with transnational feminist networks which, with which they're sort of um, merged in some cases uh, to um, promote government action on these status issues. So uh, to say, go a bit further, it's not too shocking to say feminist movements drive policy, but we're saying that they're especially important for this area. It's particularly autonomous character of these um, movements because they must be autonomous from these other agendas so that they have the space to articulate these distinctive issues. And um, uh, they, it's also not, for example, left parties, women in government, uh, or religion that shapes these issues, um, these status issues. So that's maybe even... That's maybe even a bit more interesting than saying that it's the women's movements, but I want to say that it emphasize the part about autonomy as well. So as when we start talking about issues that involve religion and class, then the story, of course, becomes more complicated. Um, so it's the, when, as I mentioned, um, policies challenge the established doctrine of the religious group, that's that top right cell of the typology I showed you, this is when church-state relationships become very relevant. This is where having a constitutionally established religion, for example, becomes very important, where having a fusion of secular and religious authority becomes key. This is what this is at the core of explaining um, cross-national variation in doctrinal issues. So this would include things like family law, abortion, and reproductive rights funding to some degree as well. Um, so these kinds of issues that com conflict with um, established doctrine of dominant religious group. Those um, uh, challenges that affect um, 
market relations, state market relations, as I mentioned. This is where we see the kind of constellation of left parties, the constellation of left politics actors become relevant. So this is where left parties start to matter, union militancy, union strength, the kind of, um, if you know um, Esping Anderson's sort of work on labor power, that whole constellation of labor actors become relevant for these issues that are um, challenging state market relations. Okay. So the framework it says that Organized feminism is particularly important for these articulating these new issues. However, the opposition and support for these issues where they're raised varies with the context. For gender issues um, inflected with class, these state market relations matters. Um, left parties and labor mobilization uh, determine these outcomes. And for um, looking at doctrinal issues, it's state church relations, particularly the institutional, the institutionalization of um, of religious authority. The political institutions, the degree to which political institutions take up religious authority. This means that, you'll see when we start talking about this, we're treating in some ways communism and colonialism and their institutional legacies as if they're part of our argument about religion. One of the reasons for that is that we think they're part of the argument about religion, um, mainly because um, communism, as you know, involved at its core um, the program to smash religious authority and to promote secularism. And as part of that, um, and also a kind of a particular approach to sex equality, which focused on formal sex equality and sex equality in the workplace. Um, and uh, that has a very strong legacy, as you'll see when I show you the results, um, in terms of um, affecting uh, the ways that uh, religion shapes um, women's status in these particular areas. Colonialism, so it's actually quite strong in promoting women's status in some particular areas. Colonialism has the reverse effect. In these post-colonial states where um, efforts to imbue institutions with additional legitimacy often um, result in states relying on the extra legitimacy that's brought by extant religious um, uh, groups and affiliations, extant religious authority, actually makes it more difficult to reform religious law and promote women's rights. So in doctrinal issues, um, what we see is that colonialism has the effect of empowering uh, religious elites and religious uh, authorities. And having a constitutionally established religion and this other kind of, the, the bigger concept here is this political institutionalization of religious authority. It fuses secular and religious power and makes it very difficult to change. Okay. So as we gave you the two by two table before for types of issues, we can make a two by two table which tells us these expectations, one model for each category. Feminist movements and international norms for this category of, of issues. Feminist movements, religious institutions, colonialism and communism for doctrinal issues. For those issues that are primarily class issues, um, left parties, labor movements and feminist movements. And we expect all of these um, uh, elements, these usual suspects of gender politics to combine in the bottom right hand um, corner. So um, when we started to explore this argument, we used um, a combination of data sources, both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, to create our data set, we used both primary and secondary sources, things like the text of laws, um, newspaper reports, activist documents, government documents, as well as you know, published articles. In some cases, there's quite an extensive literature on some of these questions um, to develop our database of women's rights. Um, we worked for more than 10 years to gather and analyze this data. Most of the gathering was accomplished between 2006 and 2010, and our team um, included at times uh, a dozen researchers, and we were funded by the National Science Foundation to undertake this research. In addition to this, we did field work, or members of our team did field work, in a bunch of different countries, including Argentina, Israel, Canada, the United States, Malaysia, Nigeria, China, India, and South Korea. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you, give you a couple of key comparisons, and then I'm going to show you some regression results. And let me just make sure that I'm not going too crazy. All right, I'm good. Okay, so um, these things that I, I want to tell you, some sort of stylized comparisons, which I'm perfectly happy to tell you more about uh, if, if you want to ask me more about them. The first thing I want to tell you is to develop a bit more of the story about Canada and Sweden um, on violence against women in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, talk a bit more about equality work as a legal status, like women's legal equality at work, versus family leave in Norway and the United States, um, Morocco's 2004 reform of family code, and the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and uh, compare that a bit with the family law in India. So let me just, um, if you buckle your seatbelts, we can go through this pretty quick, I think. Um, all right, so government action on violence against women in Canada and Sweden in the 80s and 90s. So 
the, one of the things that's interesting to me is you don't often see this acknowledged, but um, activists in Canada were um, raising the question of violence against women quite early by international standards. In 1967, um, fe uh, feminists here in Canada were criticizing the Royal Commission, which had been established for not covering violence against women. So already here we have autonomous women's movements criticizing the government, saying you're not doing enough to address violence against women, 1967. The Secretary of State Women's Program, which um, was funded, started in 1971, started to fund important and groundbreaking research, actually, um, at the behest of women's groups. It, found, it founded, it um, uh, provided funds for much of the research that these groups did, um, and supported them and provided them opportunities to address the government. And a series of amendments were quickly adopted in 1983 as a result of this whole process. Um, and this included the Rape Shield Law. This law um, actually encodified um, a proposal from the National Association for Women in the Law, which had been endorsed by the National Action Committee from the Status of Women, um, and nearly ver verbatim. So it basically took, this was, for, or should, I should say, it formed the basis for the proposal. It's very clear the, the autonomous movement's fingerprints are all over this um, legal reform. Uh, at some point this, over the next few years, this, this law eventually ended up being struck down. Um, and I should say that original um, legal reform process was overseen by a male minister of justice in the Liberal Party, who you may know, Jean Chrétien. Um, the second minister of justice who oversaw the replacement law, um, after the law was struck down, the minister of justice began immediately a consultation with feminist groups to try to find a, a way to solve this problem and replace the rape shield law, um, producing the no means no sexual assault law. And that was Kim Campbell who oversaw that particular um, uh, process, and also a Minister of Justice from the Conservative Party, from the then Progressive Conservative Party. So just to point out, male, fe male Justice, male Minister, female Minister, Liberal Party, Conservative Party, women are less than 10% of Parliament when this is taking place. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of innovative um, work on the scene. I just heard an interview the other day with a police um, uh, officer in Tennessee talking about how they've adapted from Canada a police protocol to identify risk, uh, those women who are at great risk in um, domestic violence situations. I know we use this in my local shelter in the United States as well, um, where uh, you know, I talked to some of the activists there. So I mean, it just continues that really with all the problems that there are, um, and we can say more about that, um, ca Canada has been, at least in the past, an innovator and a kind of um, trendsetter, a pace setter in developing policies on violence against women. In Sweden, in comparison, um, there was some effort to raise the issue of violence against women on the part of autonomous feminists, which were, were mostly um, very weak and very few. Um, their efforts to raise this issue were characterized as shrill and divisive. Um, people felt that this was really kind of an issue of alcoholism and um, people, other, that feminists were kind of making a big deal about something that wasn't really a problem. Um, legal reforms, such as protective orders, were adopted a decade later in Sweden compared to the United uh, Kingdom, Canada, and uh, the United States. They were, they were in use much earlier. Um, there's no public or was no public system really providing support for specialized rape crisis centers. There's still quite few. And as late as 2011, you may remember having heard about Sweden having a category of minor rape for drunk or unconscious women who are raped. And there's no required minimum penalty for this category of minor rape. Um, one of the many issues that had been raised by Amnesty International in their scathing 2010 report where they reviewed rape laws across the Nordic world, um, pointing out many, many problems with rape laws, including Sweden and other places. So just to say that you know, many of these, there were some efforts to reform, mainly in the late 1990s, um, uh, starting in 1998 or so, um, and uh, really responding to the Beijing process and uh, to um, uh, effort, effort, in, input from the European Union, but really um, not much uh, was really happening there before that. Okay. So that's kind of the difference there, is that we have autonomous, organized, strong autonomous civil society, strong uh, feminist movements in Canada. If you do actually look at the analysis over this period, um, we have the most uh, organizations, feminist organizations per capita in the world in Canada over this period. Um, and the women's lobby was described um, by at least by several um, prominent politicians as being the most strongest lobby in Canada at this time. Okay. So let me just show you now some um, quick comparisons about work family policy in the United States. So there's some really interesting parallels here between the United States and Norway and big important divergences. Um, the Pregnancy Discrimination Act adopted in 1978 in the United States is often cited as one of the most important feminist successes and the clearest example of a feminist success in policy making in the United States. It was championed by a broad coalition of feminist groups um, 
they made some deals with religious opponents to um, leave abortion out, um, and that involved that kind of cleared the way for um, not having anybody uh, any kind of religious opposition to this um, particular act. Uh, and so the Pregnancy Discrimination Act was adopted in a very uh, fast procedure. The Family Medical Leave Act, as you may know, um, took was much more protracted, it was not adopted until 1993. It was vetoed twice before it was finally adopted. It was vetoed twice by um, President Bush, the, the senior, um, Bush pair, um, uh, before, it was before it was finally adopted by President Clinton after he got elected, after elections have consequences, which we'll come back to. Um, and here's one of the consequences of elections, the FMLA got signed. Now, one of the things to notice about the FMLA is that it is unpaid leave. Uh, it is not paid leave. The U.S. stands out as one of the only countries in the developed world that has um, no paid leave. We also don't really have a left party or much of a very of a strong union movement. This is um, part of the reason that we have this anemic um, family leave. Um, so this is um, partly explaining the difference between these two different areas. In Norway, where unions are far stronger, um, similarly, we have the Equal Status Act opposed. Same year, the same kind of thing is going on. Women's movements propose it. Unions oppose it, um, of course. Um, I, I, I I'm not saying, of course, because I, I think that's a bad idea, right? But anyway, so the unions opposed it, um, uh, and uh, they ended up being um, on the losing side. The, they prevailed and were able to um, have the Equal Status Act uh, adopted. Eventually, the unions came to say, oh, okay, it's not such a big deal. We're not going to use our political capital on it. The maternity leave expansions that happened in the 1980s were strongly supported by the labor government and by unions, and Norway was the first country in the world to adopt a daddy leave, which you may have heard about, um, which are these leave schemes which give dedicated leaves to fathers that are not transferable to the mothers. Um, this was championed by um, the Labor Party. Um, there was a huge national conversation on fatherhood led by the head of the Labor Party, this man who was um, a, a very progressive feminist um, in the Labor Party. Uh, and um, the left parties here were very important. If you track you know, numbers of women and left parties, you can see that actually having the Labor Party in the Norwegian um, parliament was very important for the expansion of this maternity leave. Make sure I have story time to tell you about Morocco. Uh, I do. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the Moroccan situation, what we see here is, uh, with, as Morocco is moving toward, in a process of democratization it, through the 1990s, and one of the things that happens at the beginning of the 1990s is this one million signatures campaign, a very important feminist campaign, which puts on the agenda reform of family law. Feminists are, Moroccan feminists are, are demanding action on family law. It's very clear to the world and to Moroccans that this is a homegrown effort um, that Moroccan feminists are demanding. This was extremely powerful. It became a model for feminist movements throughout the region. Um, feminists in Iran attempted to emulate it later and in other places. Uh, in 1993, in response to these demands, some modest reforms were undertaken. Um, Morocco also ratified CETA that year. Um, and um, you know, really, some people thought, okay, well, there's been some reform, that's good. But it came under further criticism. As people started to look at these reforms, feminists continued to insist, these are not good enough. We need to have better reforms. These are not enough. They don't go far enough. They still leave, um, you know, they still leave women at the mercy of their husbands. Um, and in 1997, feminists went to CEDA and embarrassed the Moroccan government um, by criticizing them. Um, Moroccan feminists went to the CEDA provisions and criticized their own government quite publicly. Um, so it was very, um, it was felt to be embarrassing and there was an effort to try to address this at home. And the then socialist president, and Val Mogadam reports that um, he said to them, listen, are you socialists? Because if you are, we should just get together on this and I'm going to support you on this. And they said, uh, okay, whatever. And um, they put together this uh, legal reform plan, which then he, the president proposed. The Islamists were not very happy um, with this particular proposal, and they um, painted it as an initiative that came from the World Bank, um, and that was kind of an externally imposed uh, initiative. They prompted massive protests. The feminists were protesting for this um, family law. Um, Islamic um, uh, activists were protesting against it. Uh, in the end, it ended up being shelved because it was too much, too controversial. Um, Again, feminists kept up criticism of family law. A new king came to power. Um, they were trying to push under this new, um, as you know, democracy continued and this new, king, this new more liberal king came to power, feminists continued to push for legal reform. Um, but 
one of the things that happened, and you can think about how, whether, how contingent this is, but uh, there was a terrorist attack in Morocco that really undermined the Islamists. They had weaker legitimacy than usual. And the king um, took the opportunity to make um, progress on family law reform, but importantly, worked together with feminists and Islamists to try to get it passed. So he invited Islamists to be part of the process. So they developed what some people think of as a model for feminist Sharia in some ways, feminist Sharia law, a model for gender egalitarian Sharia law. It's couched in religious terms, but it is um, egalitarian in many, many respects, um, nearly all respects, um, and is thought of often as a model for the region should we want to improve women's status in family law. So it was reformed ultimately with the support of the religious authorities in Morocco. And one of the things I want to draw your attention to about this particular case is that feminists were clearly driving the bus here in terms of keeping the pressure up, but they, didn't, they, they were strengthened a lot by appealing to the kind of Beijing process and this gender, um, this ge international gender process, which had more currency with some than others, um, but also they were um, strengthened um, by also talking about development and how this would put Morocco forward and contribute to modernization in Morocco. Um, and that the primary source of opposition here was these religious opponents. Okay. Um, in, in India, we can see, I'll just, you know, if we think about the divorce reform process in India, you can see a kind of similar story in some ways to what happened in Morocco, um, but also quite different. In India, the, precip the precipitating, um, I'm thinking about divorce reform in particular, the precipitating um, event that started a big conversation about divorce reform in India was the Supreme Court decision in what was called the Shabano controversy, which was a decision in which an elderly widow um, was, um, an elderly woman was um, divorced um, unilaterally by her husband and she was left in poverty poverty after many, many years of marriage, and she was quite elderly. Uh, a Supreme Court judge said that he, she had to be given support um, and, and offered a new interpretation of um, Muslim personal law. In India, different groups are governed by different personal laws. So the state uh, gives each group, um, says to each group, you're governed by this law, you're governed by that law. Different groups are governed by different laws. There was vigorous opposition to what was perceived as interference in the proper area of authority of the Muslim Personal Law Board, which is the group that is, has the authority to make Muslim personal law. Feminists responded by demanding a uniform civil code. Get rid of all these personal laws, create a secular law, create a uniform civil code. Um, they were unsuccessful, and the, um, the uh, response here was to adopt what was called, in a kind of big brotherish way, the Muslim Women's Protection of Rights and Divorce Act, which took away some of the rights that were given to Muslim women by the Supreme Court justice in this decision that was protested. Um, so you know, out of this, this debate, feminists are demanding a uniform civil code. Muslim groups, including you know, massive numbers of Muslim women and Muslim men are protesting in the streets. They're objecting to the decision of the Supreme Court. Um, there's a huge uh, controversy and outcry, great um, uh, conflict, and this act is in introduced. Personal law, to this day, this, the feminists have not been successful in pushing for a uniform civil code, and in fact, now they don't push for a uniform civil code. Now they would not say that this is something that they want. If you go and talk to feminists in India today, they tell you, we don't want to do that anymore because this has become a political football that's been taken up by the BJP and other nationalists who like to use it to criticize Muslims who are a minority in India. Um, and to say, uh, you know, we press for a uniform civil code because we care about the status of Muslim women who uh, we think are, you know, treated badly by these sort of backward minority communities. Um, so actually, there have been small advances made in women's status, but always within the framework of Muslim, uh, of different religious personal laws, not by pushing for a uniform civil code. And now the main people who call for a uniform civil code are the BJP, and most feminist groups will not push for a uniform civil code or support that claim at all now. Um, so this is just to show you that this, this argument, this, um, this kind of effort to advance women's rights becomes entangled with these uh, uh, reforming, comes entangled with reforming religious law, which is really complicated because it's part of the sort of founding bargain of the state, which is, involves, you know, giving these elites power over these particular areas. And their, their area of authority is threatened when you're th trying to suggest new processes of reform. So as long as your reform processes don't threaten the authority of these religious authorities, you might be able to do something, but otherwise you can't do it. 
I, I, so that's about religion in India. But I want you to remember that, of course, lots of women's rights issues in India have nothing to do with religion. For example, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. This was an act when, again, we see that um, is important for poor women, for rural women. Um, it guarantees 100 days of work for rural workers. And there are set aside seats for women and uh, accountability provisions that make sure that these um, jobs go to women. There are there's child care provided as part of this act. It's a really important act for advancing poor women in rural areas. Um, it was, again, a case where elections have consequences. This was a case where there was a big election that a coalition of center and left parties won. They um, had promised to do this National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. They had promised to set aside um, seats for uh, jobs for women. Um, they did that when they were elected. There were times when they were thinking, maybe we don't want to do this stuff for women that we talked about. And the women's activists that were involved in that process pushed very hard to make sure that those um, benefits for women were included in this law. But we wouldn't have been having the law in the first place if we'd not had this election and this coalition of center-left parties um, win. So what I'm, what I'm hoping you're seeing here is that here we have these different kinds of issues, like the different issues that I was telling you about. On the status issues like violence against women, you can see the importance of auto autonomous feminism. When we're talking about these issues that challenge religious authority, we're having to talk about a whole different question about the structure of the state and the way the relationship between state and religious authorities. We're not talking about that, that when we're talking about reforming rape law. We're not talking about that even when we're talking about um, you know, employment, rural employment guarantees or some of these other class issues or maternity leave. We're not talking about religious at all in these particular cases. We're talking about unions and left parties. So there are different actors that become salient for these different issues. Let me show you how this helps us understand global patterns in these laws, now that I've just told you some specific little stories. Um, so here's um, some of the results of our research on family law. This um, uh, shows the uh, range of an index that goes from one area to 13 areas of, of uh, family law. It, higher scores reflect more equality, lower, lower scores reflect less equality. 13 areas of family law are covered by this particular index. They include things like marriage, divorce, this is a list, which I don't know if you can hear that, but marriage, um, divorce, um, marital names, property regimes, inheritance, rights to children, um, property, adultery, things like that. 13 different areas. So, in 1975, here's a map of the world. Can you see this? So, here's a map of the world. Um, and for this map, the um, red areas are the worst areas in terms of inequality. Um, and the navy blue areas are the best. So, you can see in this area that the communist world is looking very progressive compared to the rest of the world in 1975, but there's quite a bit of variation. So the reason I want you to notice this, I'm going to show you another area where there's not a lot of variation in 1975. Then in family law, there's lots of variation in 1975. Um, you can see that in Europe, well, I don't know, maybe you can't, but in Europe, there's all different, literally countries at every level. Um, and in the Middle East and North Africa, there are also countries, um, uh, mostly um, countries at the low end of the scores here. Um, Asia also has many countries with lots of inequality. As you talk about 1985, actually, in the MENA region, we see um, additional countries that have inequality. Um, in Europe, we see a con start to see a convergence towards greater equality. Um, and as we get to 1995, same process, um, more greater equality in Europe, um, more or less staying the same in the MENA region. Um, and by 2005, uh, you see much more spread of equality throughout the world in family law, much more convergence on that. Um, the main sticking points are in the MENA region, um, with a little bit in East Asia, but mostly in the MENA region. Um, if I compare this picture that I just told you to the pattern on violence against women, you'll see that it's quite different. So the, our index on violence against women also is one where higher scores mean more action on um, violence, better equality promotion, lower scores, less equality promotion. Our violence against women indicator includes um, elements that focus on services, elements that focus on legal reform, um, pro uh, programs that are targeted to vulnerable populations of women, training for professionals, prevention programs, and administrative reforms. So in 1975, you can see a lot of uniformity, right? Nothing much is happening in the area of violence against women around the world. We're still not seeing any country that's doing a lot of um, things on the area of violence against women. And I should say that's for uh, rape, domestic violence, and other kinds of um, violence as well. <laughs> 
By 1985, we start to see um, some countries taking action on violence. That's Canada, Australia, the United States, um, Britain, France, and Sweden. Um, in 1985, are taking some measures to address violence against women. By 1995, um, it's quite clear that the United States, Canada, and Australia are um, the most responsive countries in the world. Um, and if you look at Europe and Latin America, this is the thing I was promising to show you, you can see that um, uh, Latin America is actually, if anything, there's more of this green and less red <laughs> and very little yellow in Latin America, but in um, Europe, you have still some red, lots of yellow, a little bit of green, um, but there's, you know, not, not a necessarily clear um, pattern of Europe being more advanced. In fact, if anything, Latin America is slightly more advanced in the mid-90s in terms of addressing violence against women. Um, in the MENA region, not much is happening. And you'll notice that the communist countries, I don't know if you can see this, but the communist countries remain as the worst countries for addressing violence against women throughout this period. So remember, for family law, they started out being very strong um, for equality in family law. When it comes to violence against women, a very different pattern Communism appears to inhibit um, action on violence against women. Um, and that stays the same. There's a little bit of action by 2005, which is, of course, when you start to see some of these countries becoming more democratic, um, some women's movements emerging, but um, by and large, a very different story. So by 2005, there's quite a bit of variation, but by 19, in 1975, you see there's quite a lot of similarity. So very different patterns for family law and violence against women. If we look at these areas, as well as some others, using a regression analysis, so if we look, take all of this data for countries and for years that I was just telling you about, and use a, what's called a panel data analysis. It's kind of like taking a survey, and you put um, all the data into different waves. You ask people the same questions at several years. It's kind of like doing the same thing with countries. If you ask countries, where are countries standing? In this, in this decade, in this decade, in this decade, and you look at them over these years and ask, what are the correlates of progress? What are the correlates of positive and negative change over those years? Um, what do we find? So I did a couple of different things. We did a lot of different things with analysis, and I can't show it all to you today. You're probably happy about that. Um, but um, one of the things we did was take the same model and apply it to each area just to make this point, which you see from the graphs, which is that there were different stories for each of these areas. And then the other thing we did then was start to analyze each of these areas more particularly, right, to try to really get at, well, what's the best explanation for this area, given that, you know, violence against women or employment law or maternity leave um, are all different kinds of issues. So for those who are interested in these kinds of things, we used random effects. Um, it's a GLS type of regression. Um, and, um, okay, that's all. I can say more about that in the question period. There's um, independent variables. Oh, many independent variables were included. Many control variables um, were included, including feminist movement, strength, and autonomy. And I'm not checking my phone. I'm seeing how long I've been talking. Okay. Um, uh, CEDA ratification, or whether um, reservations to CEDA have been withdrawn constitutionally, whether there's a constitutionally established religion, as I mentioned. We also have a measure of religious legislation that we used in one or two of these um, regressions. I mostly aren't showing those to you. Um, religiosity from the World <coughs> Value Survey, whether a country is majority Catholic or majority Muslim, um, measures for religious and left parties, whether the party, whether the country was a former colony or whether uh, it is a country with a communist legacy and then other controls, GDP, democracy level, women in government. Okay, so we looked at these, these um, for across a bunch of different areas. For this analysis, when we're comparing areas to each other, everything is me measured zero to 10, higher scores meaning more equality, lower scores meaning less equality. This table, which you cannot see at all, I don't think, compares violence against women, family law, abortion legality, maternity leave, and reproductive rights funding. I think maybe if I go to my next slide, you might be able to see that. Um, this represents the results. Um, and what I really want to show you is that even though this is the same model, it's quite different across these five areas. Different R squareds, it has a different um, kind of success rate in reducing errors for each of these different areas. The models are not equally good for these areas. Um, but also, um, different variables are important for each of these area, areas, showing some of the, that some of the um, things I was saying later have more analytic purchase in some areas than others. So, um, for example, um, strong autonomous feminist movements um, have a positive and significant effect for violence against women, um, for family law, and for reproductive rights funding in this particular case. We don't see this come up in the area of abortion legality for this particular analysis. When we do a lagged version of this variable, which I can explain the reasons for doing that, we do see very strong results for abortion legality. Overall, what we see in our regression models is that feminist um, uh, 
feminist movements, autonomous feminist movements, autonomous feminist movements are strongly associated with the outcomes in the status um, issues that we talked about. Um, we also see um, CEDA in this analysis, very important for uh, violence against women. We saw less effect in these other areas, except when we started to do really um, more specific modeling on reproductive rights funding, we did find that CEDA mattered there as well, quite importantly. And in some models, it matters in family law a little bit. Um, for um, just This just shows you a little bit more specific modeling that we did um, for violence against women. And what we did here in this particular model that we couldn't do in the bigger models is to look at the interaction between strong autonomous women's movements and um, international norms. And what we find in this model is that the interaction of those two things is very powerful and more powerful than either of them alone. And that, for example, if you sign a human rights agreement without having a domestic movement, it actually is negatively correlated with your human rights adoption of laws um, internally. Um, with a, uh, a domestic movement, it's a, a associated with progress. I'm going to just um, show you the same, uh, our findings about religion very quickly. Um, the main thing I want to tell you about religion is that no matter what kind of religious variables we use in these models, we find that the coefficients are negative pretty much for every area except for maternity leave. So this is just three different ones, religious party, religiosity, and a constitutionally established religion. Um, if we even put them in all together, they're all negative. Religion is negatively associated with women's rights for most of these areas except for maternity leave, but it's very, very powerful in the area of family law um, in particular and has some effects on abortion and reproductive rights funding as well. In this model, it turns out to be important some violence against women, but once we control for other things that I showed you in the model before, it drops out. Um, so this, but the finding of religion and family law is extremely robust, um, and the thing that is most interesting is that the most powerful effects that we really find are for institutional variables. So the things that really matter in the area of religion are exactly the institutional variables we talked about before. Constitutionally established religion, and the better measures we get for this, the more powerful our model is. So then when we went to this more refined measure with the laws, looking at how many laws um, uphold religious principles, we got really powerful effects. Um, uh, when we looked at, if you look at communist legacies or colonialism, also very, very strong in determining these doctrinal issues. So these religious institutions and institutions that empower or impede um, religious, organized religion are very important for these doctrinal areas. Um, I'm not, so let me just show you one quick thing about religion and then I'll, I'll try to wrap up super quickly. Um, which is that, what does it tell us, for example? So one thing we found was that, you know, Islam and Catholic, uh, Islamic countries and ca Muslim countries and predominantly Muslim countries and predominantly Catholic countries matter um, differently for different issues. So for abortion, being a predominantly Catholic country matters more. For uh, uh, family law, being a predominantly Muslim country matters more. That's not surprising to anybody who studies religion, right? Abortion is a salient issue for uh, Catholicism, not, not as much for others. Um, Sharia or family personal law is a very salient issue for Islamic countries. So let me just go show you a little bit more about how these institutional variables really help us get a purchase on what's going on in um, Muslim countries. So here's just looking at Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries for equality. So look, we learned something, right? It's very clear. Non-Muslim countries, we don't see any countries in this area right here, um, which is below five. So if we know that a country is not Muslim, we learn a little bit about its family law. We know that it's probably not good to say, you're, you're probably on shaky ground to say that you're going to have a great inequality at the um, low level, um, you're, going, you're more likely to be in the range from 5 to, to 14, 5 to 13. You can see that quite clearly. However, the interesting thing to notice is if we know that a country is Muslim, it doesn't help us as much, right? So we don't know. Now it could be anywhere in this whole range. You see the whole range. It doesn't give us as much leverage to help explain the variation among Muslim countries. So we're still left with a major analytic um, project. Maybe it's religiosity, right? You might say maybe it is religiosity that tells us we have a similar problem with religiosity. Again, we learned something, right, from looking at religiosity and sex equality. We learned that there's not very much in this bottom left quadrant where you have low levels of religiosity, more equality. But if you're looking at high levels of religiosity, there's quite a few, there's quite a bit of a spread. Low levels of religiosity make more equality more likely. High levels of religiosity we don't know, right? So we still have kind of an analytic puzzle at this, at this end. 
when we look at institutional variables, we see what we like to see when we're doing a linear analysis, which is a more tightly structured um, line, right? So we know more. We not only know about this quadrant, we also know about this quadrant. Um, so we know that when we get higher um, fusion of religious authority, we have less equality in family law. And this finding is very robust to everything we throw at it. This is just a bivariate scatter plot, but this, is, this stands up to a lot of different things that we find. So it's not so much the doctrinal issue, it's not so much the um, uh, religiosity, although it matters a little bit, it's not so much whether it's Muslim or Catholic, um, it's more whether the religious institutions and the uh, secular institutions are fused. Um, that gives us um, a kind of analytic purchase that none of those other religious variables do. Our findings about left parties, I'm just going to sh- summarize very quickly and then I'm really going to end. Um, the left parties we find in this big model, it's sort of weak. We find that the coefficients are positive where we expect them on the class issues and negative on the other issues. Significance we don't see so much here. Um, in more specific modeling, we do find that they're specific. I can show you that in the middle. In the middle, in particular, um, looking at abortion legality compared to um, reproductive rights. And this is some analysis I've done with a graduate student named Jose Carre. And you can really see here that left parties are more significant um, where uh, abortion, um, abortion, just looking at abortion legality, they don't matter. So again, when you take the doctrinal issue and it becomes a class issue, then left parties matter. They don't matter as much when it's just a question of legal status that challenges um, doctrine. So to get back to the thing I said at the beginning, women's rights are not a single basket of issues. We have to look at them in these different categories to really get purchase on what's going on. Um, Feminist movements matter the most for these status issues, but religious and in the institutional context that enable or obstruct organized religion shape doctrinal issues. Left parties matter more for what we're calling class issues. Um, Okay. Uh, So in a way, this multidimensional approach really fits with uh, an emerging understanding and approach to thinking about intersectionality. Um, it talks about gender not as a single um, package of issues, but as a, a series of issues, a family, a family relationship set of issues. And it suggests a new way of trying to analyze these issues, trying to think about them in these di- qualitatively different categories. Um, disaggregation is core to intersectional analysis of um, gender issues, and this isn't any different. Um, that we're saying class, group status, and religion define distinct dimensions of gender. More generally, um, you know, you might think about whether something like this could be used in other areas of political science. So, for example, are there other places where we're just talking about things that are primarily status hierarchy issues? Are there other issues where we're just thinking about um, uh, you know, class politics or religious institutions? And can we think about d- dividing our issues, say, not into health or transportation or other kind of conventional ways of dividing them, but thinking about who they what are the institutions and the identities to which these um, issues relate? I'm thinking in particular, I don't know if you know work by Christian Davenport. I always find his work to be really fascinating. But he has this research which builds on the work that is well established that shows that the state tends to repress people who raise property issues or do damage to property. Damaging property or um, raising issues about class are um, pretty good um, predictors for being re- pressed by the state as a protester. Um, What Christian Davenport finds is that's not true if you're an African-American protester. If you're an African-American protester, um, you get repressed no matter what issue you raise. So um, we're really, in terms of thinking about state-society relationships, we have to think not only about issues, which gives us some insight, but also about the identities and groups and how they relate to these historic conflicts to figure out what's going on. And the usual divisions of comparative politics and of international relations are not giving us much leverage on some of these models. I mean, not on all of them, or at least not on all of them, right? They're not consistently the go-to explanations. We use them to define our field, and yet they're not always the most important explanatory variables for these issues. Wealth, region, democracy, other kinds of things matter differently for these different issues. So I will stop there and let you ask questions. When you ask a question, please turn on the microphone in front of you. When your question is done, please turn it off again. And at RGCS lectures, the first question is reserved for a member of the RGCS Student Fellowship. Uh, no, uh, Sorry, not the PhD students. The, okay. uh, 
Um, so a lot of these variables that you, I mean, you had like 20 something variables and, but a lot of them are very like, I guess, qualitative and a little bit nebulous and mm -hmm. arguably subjective. So like, mm -hmm. how did you, um, operationalize these variables and put them in as like an index in your research? Yeah. Nearly everything interesting is nebulous. Um, so uh, <laughs> if you want, uh, lots, of, lots of boring things are really easy to measure. Um, so, uh, but yeah, um, so I guess for me it would be easiest to tell you about specific uh, variables. But so some things are just established. So, you know, national wealth is actually not that easy to measure really, but we have a lot of things that we just accept a lot of really kind of crappy measures for it, but so we just joined everybody else in doing that. Um, so we used logged GDP per capita in our, um, uh, yeah, in our equations, which isn't bad, right? It's okay. But you could do, you could try to think of other things. There are lots of problems and criticisms of doing that, but that's pretty much the standard. So in that, we didn't do anything new. In the area of um, our dependent variables, as I mentioned, what we did there was, as I said, go through a whole bunch of different um, uh, documents. Uh, we have co we had coders code the documents. We reviewed their coding. Um, so we, we had a team of people. We always had multiple coders. We identified areas where the coders disagreed. Um, then we went back over. We developed new coding rules. So that kind of stuff. You're right. It, it still is a question of judgment in each case, we hope that the rules that we develop for most of these variables that we developed are clear enough that somebody else could go through and find the same thing. Um, but there were, you know, things that are, so we know what the things are that tended to, people tended to make mistakes about. We tried to make our coding rules such that they were very clear that certain things should be counted in certain ways. A key thing that I'll just mention is when we were talking about the women's movement, a thing we really um, tried to hold the line on and that was, um, trickier was to make sure that people did not, our coders, our students and um, re researchers on our team, and, or us, I mean, we didn't do this, but um, made sure not to ever code a movement as being strong because somebody said it influenced policy because that would have meant that we were including um, the dependent variable and coding the independent variable. The truth is, is that we have so many different dependent variables that vary that it would actually be pretty hard to code something in relation to every dependent variable, but uh, we tried not to do that. Um, make, we made that a rule that you couldn't say that. So things that indicated strength, which is one of these nebulous concepts, were things like, um, actually the World Value Series has a survey has a question which says, um, basically gets at the popular support for the women's movement. Do you support the women's movement? We use that as a um, uh, measure of strength. We also used um, uh, the number of organizations uh, as an indication. Um, it, all, questions of autonomy, we looked for an organizational basis outside established political institutions. So if all, like this is the case in Sweden, that a lot of feminist groups um, were inside political parties and inside the state, there's not an autonomous basis for feminist organizing that had any influence or power. So the problem with that is that if you want to raise an issue and you're inside a party, you have to get your issue onto the onto the Labor Party's agenda, let's say, right? And so you have to convince them that they've got 20 different issues that they're arraying in importance, and you have to convince them that this issue, whatever it is, violence against women, sexual harassment, you know, pay discrimination, is something that they should be on, and it's competing with a bunch of other issues. If you have your own autonomous base, you can order those things however you want, but you're not competing with other issues. That's just one example of um, a kind of a decision rule. So usually um, we had those kinds of decision rules, and then we would have them checked. So we had multiple people check them, um, go over them. Uh, that's why it took us so long. <laughs> and we still go back now and look at the data, and I'm sure other people who have built data sets do this and go like, okay, why did we do this? Okay, right, go back to the coding rules and go back through and you look at a coding and think, what, that's crazy, and then, oh yeah, 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 okay, now I remember, right, that's why we did that, okay, right, can't change it, good, okay. So, um, you know, there's that, um, you know, so that's uh, one example. Um, so we did create the data. The, the, the legislation is kind of a hybrid case. The religious legislation is a hybrid case. So that's a data set developed by Jonathan Fox. I don't know if you know his work on religion. Um, but he has a huge database of religious laws. He actually has a huge database on religion. If you're interested in doing stuff on religion, it's very interesting. He's got indicators of everything. Um, but one of the things we did with that, we did not want to include in his... Um, measures of legislation. He has many examples of laws that are actually sex equality laws. So we um, adapted his measure to take out anything that was related to gender or to sexuality um, so that we have a pure measure of uh, religious laws that has nothing to do with um, uh, the things that we are looking at, family law, violence against women, and so on. So that's a kind of a hybrid measure where we took an existing measure and adapted it. So we did all of those different things to get at those different variables.
Um, so I noticed that the, the countries that first seemed to fight against violence against women were also the last countries to abolish slavery. And it, was, it seemed like it was Brazil, the United States. I couldn't tell what color Cuba was, but the mm. Caribbean was pretty mm -hmm. dark. And then mm -hmm. I was wondering how kind of like a collective memory of like violence against women as like a political and economic institution may have like changed the identities of the autonomous feminist groups. Wow, that's really interesting. Nobody's ever asked me that before. That's a great <laughs> question. Um, uh, I don't think that there'd be a direct relationship there, but I, I wonder if like Brazil, the United States are places where there are, well, in the US at least, I'm thinking about the civil rights movement as being a kind of a forerunner or kind of a shaper in some ways of the women's movement. Um, uh, in, in the United States, not so, so much in Canada, you don't see the same pattern of emergence. And um, so I'm not, I'm not so sure I would see that um, effect through the movements. One thing I've thought about sometimes is, you know, being more comfortable with group-specific issues, like violence against women is kind of a group-specific issue. You have to be okay with saying there are some things that are going to be problems for some groups and not for others. And in, for example, in Norway and Sweden, there was a lot of discomfort with that kind of talk. Um, they really wanted only universalistic talk. So if you talked about violence, they didn't want to talk about um, violence against women. Um, they wanted to only talk about violence in general terms. So it actually makes it difficult if those problems are quite different and you need different answers. So one of the things about slavery that could be a connection is that it's a very distinctive experience for a specific group. Maybe it, maybe it in some ways gets people used to thinking about group justice, justice in kind of group-specific ways maybe, but it's not... I haven't thought about it as specifically related to slavery. That's a really interesting thing. I'd have to think about it um, more. Um, that's a, it's a great question, though. Yeah. I see somebody's hand. I'll let you call on people. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, because you, you talked about the autonomy of the feminist movement yeah. as a, something that... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that plays a role. Mm -hmm. um, would you? I'm just curious to hear about the autonomy of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. uh, whether religion has to play, uh, play some role in the labor movement. Whether organized parties or state parties really organize the the labor movement generally. Uh, whether that because I know mm -hmm. like prior to the cover to the period you cover, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, some unions were were basically organized uh, around the church. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you mm -hmm. think that'd be uh, an interesting way of thinking about the issue. That is, that's really interesting. Um, one thing I was just going to say, the first thing, the, the last thing you just said was the unions um, organized around the church, but the thing you said before about that, I had something to say to you. What was the first thing you said? Can you just repeat the very first part? Uh, maybe state parties? Oh, yeah. uh, organizing okay. Okay, the labor yeah. Okay, this is the thing I wanted to say to you. So first I wanted to say yes. Autonomy and militancy of the labor movement is important. That is a kind of a data issue that we were not, not able to solve so much. So in some of my work, I've looked at militancy versus labor power, traditionally defined, um, comparing like, so for example, strikes and lockouts. How many strikes and lockouts are there to the likelihood that you'll adopt um, something like maternity leave um, versus uh, having power in government? Strikes and lockouts are a better indicator. Unfortunately, though, we don't have as good data on that. I'd have to get involved in another major data project, um, <laughs> which I, 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 you know, I'm not uninterested in doing, but um, I just, uh, at the moment, I have to finish this one. But, um, the, uh, you know, so, so I, I think that you're, pro I would expect that you're right, that if you looked at the autonomy of labor movements, you would find that autonomy there was also powerful. Um, I don't know, so the more that, you know, union elites get paid off, the more they get absorbed into politics as usual, the more they're kind of in these kind of sedimented patterns. Um, the more autonomous they are and more free-flowing, the more likely you are to be able to um, push for a more radical agenda or even ha have your inside allies who can be more moderate say, do what I'm telling you because otherwise you've got to deal with these radical people and you don't want to talk to them. All right, so that is very good. Um, on the question of whether religion and the union um, uh, are sometimes related. Yes, I mean, we do see, like if you notice on maternity leave, we saw some positive effects of religion. It's something we didn't think about at the beginning of our project. Um, but I think as we've been going along, we've been thinking more about the fact, like, so for example, if you look at the US states, you see that it's the, um, the states that are more Catholic that were early to adopt in the brief period when we had a state level maternity leave in the US. Um, it was the Catholic states that were more likely to adopt a maternity leave first. There's a lot of literature on kind of maternalism um, uh, and on uh, the ways that uh, religion um, can, can be part of the sort of um, 
positive social compact type of way of thinking about um, state. It's quite different, though, in some ways, than a more kind of militant labor rights approach to social protection and social provision. So uh, I, I don't think that there's not, there isn't as much a, a positive role for religion, although we didn't theorize that initially. I do think it's there. I think it's more limited when you're talking about um, actual gender change policies, gender role change. So the things that I found was that if you're, for example, looking at things like daddy leave or um, even... Uh, you know, real cha rules about discrimination, then you're not going to, I would doubt very much that you would find religion um, as being important. But in the case of um, uh, particular types of social protection measures, you might find there to be a positive effect of religion there, but not so much when you're talking about social change. So the more militant um, uh, groups, um, and it might seem might be true for religion, actually, too. I mean, I may have to think about religion. I, I usually think about religion in terms of these organized religion, but maybe I should think more about um, kind of religious protest. I haven't thought about that so much. Um, anyway, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, first of all, thanks for a very interesting talk. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's try this again. Um, so my question is... <laughs> I can hear you. I'll repeat it so that it's in the mic. Aberdeen's question is... Constructed, mm -hmm. and the second would be if a law is badly enforced. Um, mm -hmm. And my case study for both of those would be uh, domestic violence laws in the United States, mm -hmm. where if, say, a woman wants to get a restraining order against an abusive partner, she's obliged to give him her address so she can stay away, so he can stay away from it. Mm -hmm. um, or often, um, it's simply not enforced by police. Um, and it seems like in the case of violence against women laws, that's that's an issue where. Mm -hmm like your point of contact with the state means that you're going to have a lot more variation in terms of how those laws are put into practice. Um, so I'm wondering if uh, you could comment on that and if maybe like there there would be any way that you could discuss maybe the, the effects that would have on your, your research or if you think that the effect would be small enough that you'd still just want to talk about in terms of laws. Yeah. Thank you. You raise a really important point, and I didn't want to spend my whole time on preliminaries, but one of the things I would have said, so the question is, um, wh what about variation in the nature of these laws and the way the law is working? There could be problems in the way the law is designed. There could be problems in the way the law is enforced. I especially want to talk about the ways the law is enforced, um, just to make sure that's a very important issue. Um, and we are not talking about um, policy enforcement or policy implementation, legal enforcement or legal implementation in this project, although that is a very important area for violence against women or for actually, actually for every single area <laughs> that we're talking about. So the thing that you're talking about with having laws on the books not be translating smoothly into laws on the ground, of course, is true for most areas of law, but it's especially true for any um, type of social change issue uh, like, like gender equality issues. There's usually big gaps between the promises made in the law and the outcomes on the ground. So that's true for every area, and violence against women is no exception, um, as you rightly point out. Um, our project doesn't look at outcomes, so I want to say two things about that. Why not? So does what's the use of looking at adoption after all? If we care about women's rights, don't we care about the effect of these laws, not just the words that are written on pieces of paper? Well, yes, except for the following thing, which is that po as political scientists, right, we want to know how do you get, how do you get, look, let's say we know what the good law is, right? We know, oh, here's the legal design, here's the electoral reform, right, that will get more women elected to office. Here's the thing that will solve, uh, you know, wartime rape or whatever issue we've been talking about, right? How do we get that law adopted? Well, if all we ever do is study the effects of laws, we won't know anything about the political process that leads us to adopt laws. And if we care about getting the right laws adopted, if we think it matters, 
what law gets adopted at all, right? Not to say that it's smooth, right? But if it has any effect, if we care about it, then we need to know what that is. We actually don't know that, right? So that's one of the reasons we did this project. We actually don't know why some laws are adopted and others aren't. I mean, now we know more, I think, because of this project that we did. But so that's one important thing. We can't even get at those other questions, which I agree are really important questions, and I think we go there. We'll go there in a future project, but the first step is to figure out how do these laws even get adopted in the first place. So I think that the issues you raise are really important, um, and I wouldn't for a moment deny the, the thing that you say, which is that you know, there's going to be huge variation in enforcement. Um, one thing we considered in terms of framing this project was, would the likelihood of enforcement affect whether a policy would be likely to be adopted? In some ways, it is, right? So, like, that's one of the reasons why we were saying that, um, you know, people are likely to sign on to human rights regimes where there's no um, domestic social movement to hold their feet to the fire. Uh, they think it's going to be costless. They're not always right about that, but that's often a bargain that they're making, and that's why when people sign on to these human rights agreements in the absence of a domestic movement, you sometimes see a negative effect, um, for example. Um, also, we think that, for example, in Nigeria, when we did our interviewing there about maternity leave, people were, we were asking about things like daddy leave, and people were like, don't, don't even talk to me about this. This is f kind of funny. Like, let's, this is, you've got to be joking to ask me about something like daddy leave. I mean, Ha, 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 okay, can now we talk about something serious? Um, uh, so, you, you know, I mean, they, it was like so far off the realm of possibility that the government was going to be able to do this that we didn't even, they didn't want to talk about it. But they do have paid a law that guarantees paid maternity leave in Nigeria. Here's the thing that's surprising. Some of these places actually provide paid maternity leave. I think that's sort of surprising, right? Like Nigeria, India, lots of these countries have government get mandated maternity leave. That's enforced and that actually makes a difference. People get it. Um, I thought that was pretty surprising. So, um, you know, in, I mean, that's not what we looked at as a measure, but, I mean, it's not right to assume that the law doesn't matter at all. I'd say one other thing in defense of looking at ado legal adoption or policy adoption rather than outcomes, and that is that actually legal policy adoption is a very important political phenomenon in its own right as well. Um, it sends powerful signals. It can be powerfully motivating. It's very important for people's self-conception and for people's understanding about whether they live in a just society, no matter how it ends up being manhandled, right? Sometimes, to use a in, probably an inapt phrase, but the, um, you know, the idea that the government is genuinely trying to solve a problem, sometimes it's not an enforcement problem because of lack of political will. Sometimes it's lack of competence. Sometimes it's you don't have a very good administrative structure. But the feeling that there's a problem that somebody's trying to get right can make a big difference um, to people on the ground versus feeling like your, project, your problem is being ignored. Nobody thinks it's legitimate. Nobody cares about what's happening to you. Um, nobody cares about your legal standing in law. You're not even a legal person, right? I mean, these things matter. Being a legal person matters. Being treated properly in the law can be very important and empowering. So I guess I also think that the law and policy are important even when they don't produce the outcomes that we hope for. On the design issue, I would just say I agree that po proper policy design is good, but I think that focusing on proper policy design is kind of um, abstract or not relevant if we don't know how to get people to adopt those policies in the first place. So I think this kind of political question about how do we get governments to get, how do we create the political will to pass the laws that we think are important um, is, is uh, a prior one for me anyway. Um, so. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I almost hesitate to ask the following question because it may not be the best form, but I was wondering what your response or comments would be to a woman, for instance, who would claim that her experience cannot be captured fully in legal terms. Um, so things that are outside the law and that mm. can't be codified within legal terms, uh, things like cultural norms or right. institutions or things that some women don't even care about, you know, but that some women, others, find super important. Um, and, yeah, basically, so, like, the tension between, like, the liberal conception of it and the more, like, um, cultural conception, I suppose. Right. I, I, I think that's a very appropriate and important question. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, so, so what you're saying is, you know, there are issues that, for some people, you know, questions of legality or legal status are not going to be that important, or there might be ways of thinking about life that don't involve so much um, these public guarantees, and I, I think that's absolutely right, and it's important to keep in mind. Um, I would say, though, that, that in terms of the, 
the project that's driving us here, it isn't so much that we think that these issues that we're looking at exhaust the issue list of things that could be important to women, or that informal things are not important, or even that the government should solve every problem of sex equality. Um, rather, it's saying, uh, the question being that, okay, we know there are some areas where government action is pretty important to advance sex equality. There are problems of sex inequality. Government action is very important in some of these areas to advance it. There could be other areas where government action is not important. Unclear. Do we want um, government action to, you know, misrepresentation of women in, in media, um, inequality of, we were talking today, uh, with, I was talking with one of the graduate students about, you know, pay gaps in um, uh, Jennifer Lawrence not being paid as much as her male counterparts, right? Like, there's lots of cultural um, ways that women are not valued equally to men. Not clear that law is the best way to address those. Civil society strategies may be the best, right? Things like, um, you know, having women's cultural festivals or, uh, you know, having women uh, active through civil society criticize others, raise good arguments. Those could be better solutions in some cases. Um, so I think we're agnostic about the fact that whether we think government can solve every problem, but um, rather there are a set of problems that are a serious set of important problems for sex equality. Government action is critical for women's citizenship in those areas, and so why do some governments um, uh, act on that um, important promise, try to promote um, sex equality and freedom, and others do not? Uh, and so that's more of the, the way we're phrasing it rather than this exhausts everything that might be important to women. Um, I, I, I appreciate very much the um, emphasis on these informal and more uh, cultural things. Yeah. I think you're much just said that one more comment. Maybe okay. like it relates to what you said about autonomy of like women's advocacy groups. Like mm -hmm. that could be a possible avenue, right? Like that's Absolutely. extra governmental. Yeah. And actually, right? I, in some other research, I'm really talking about the importance, right, of those groups being outside government, outside all these other institutions, partly because I think that that area um, uh, of kind of free association is very important. And that if you look at it, there's things that we don't think, some people wouldn't value them, right? Political scientists would say, oh, those are not important. Those are just music festivals or cultural events. We don't want to know about those. We want to study politics. But if you look at them very carefully, actually, those are very important political um, arenas in which um, people form associations that form the basis for all action in all kinds of spheres. And the more you study politics, the more you understand how important social networks and um, things are. You know, these riots in, in Paris, they were trying to figure out why people participated in the riots, and they found out that some people came out and looked down the street and said, oh, there's a riot, and started participating in it, and other people didn't, right? So it depended on, well, you know, hey, this is in my neighborhood. It's kind of easy to get involved in. I'm going to go get involved in it versus um, not, right? So this is these kinds of kind of casual, why are you going to go to a protest? Well, your friend said, I'm going to a protest. Do you want to go? A survey, here's, a really, here's one of my favorite examples, a survey of people attending a pro-life protest in D.C. These are people who got on a bus and spent the whole day going to D.C. to protest abortions. A lot of them were pro-choice. <laughs> How can this be? Well, the pastor at my church organized it and all my friends were going and I didn't really want to rock the boat, so I just thought I'd go along and stand in the street in D.C. with a picture of a bloody fetus because that seemed to be that was, you know, so peer groups, social networks can be more important in deciding who participates in what than your ideas or, you know, so the idea that, so, I mean, so I, I, I completely agree that this kind of autonomous area of social networks is really important for understanding political behavior and action um, and can be more important sometimes than some of the other things that we political scientists think are more important. Uh, on that note, I was wondering if you noticed any striking differences in sorts of <laughs> <laughs> expectations that uh, uh, lobby groups had uh, for the sorts of laws that um, they wanted passed. Uh, you touched on the sorts of compromises they had to make with other groups, but I think I'm wondering more in terms of, uh, from a cultural perspective, whether it meant the same thing usually or generally for, uh, you know, person in country A to advocate for reproductive rights than it did for a person in country B. And I ask because you seem to have covered the entire world, yeah. more um, or less. No, well, I say very different um, in those contexts. So, for example, um, when we did interviewing in Nigeria about abortion, you couldn't even really talk to people about it because it was so, it wasn't like, oh, it's, people have different opinions. It was like, someone might kill me. <laughs> you know, so people were not willing to talk about abortion. It was not something that people were willing to talk about. It was too off the, 
possible range. So nobody's um, pushing for abortion rights in Nigeria because they won't even talk about them privately in an interview. Um, and my student who did a lot of this research in Nigeria was also accused of being a CIA operative and a bunch of other scary things by Boko Haram. I'm just glad she made it back home from her field research um, uh, without uh, being abducted or something. Um, but anyway, so, so I mean, we, we really, uh, very different um, attitudes. If you look at, um, uh, you know, people in uh, approaching, for example, in, in Morocco, uh, this is more thinking about um, family law than reproductive rights, but really, um, in, in, you know, there was a, a definite strategic decision to frame things in a religious way. It wasn't that these feminists were, like, super religious, but they said, we tried the other way, it didn't work, um, let's try saying that it fits with religion and see how that goes, um, and that worked for them. Um, in India, uh, really the kind of whole reproductive rights thing, when I interviewed activists there, they uh, did not feel like it was a controversial issue, for example, abortion. The, the real controversy there had more to do with being protected from sterilization abuse. Um, to the extent that activists were charged up, they were very worried about people, Western drug companies doing um, experimental um, things to women's bodies. Um, like abortion, it was kind of hard to get people going on, whether they were like Hindu fundamentalists or women's rights activists. You talk to them and they'd be like, yeah, yeah, kind of abortion, and it's not, uh, yeah, it's one of the Hindu principles, I think, or maybe not. And, but anyway, let's talk about sterilization abuse. Um, so really, uh, in terms of framing that issue and trying to get more action on it, it's just a completely different uh, context. So that's part of what we're trying to get at with the, the story that we're talking about. I don't know if that answers your question at all. It does. Okay, good. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, so I noticed earlier you mentioned uh, one, of the, uh, one of India's, uh, the, the gender equality for India's like, laws were Mo mainly like pushed by the Supreme Court, and it was a Supreme Court ruling that decided it. In one of the areas, yeah. In one of the areas. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, throughout your research, did you notice like, a difference between uh, countries or areas where the, it was mostly the courts that mm -hmm. was the source of mm -hmm. change versus mm -hmm. like, the actual legislator? Well, to be clear, in the Indian case, I wouldn't say it was the courts that were the source of change because there are lots of feminist lawyers in India who have been action, the form against rape, I mean, uh, you know, for pushing for family law reform, pushing for legal reform on rape and violence for a very long time since the mid-70s. So like a couple of years ago, there was a big uh, uproar about um, gang rape in India, which I believe was appropriate. But one of the things that people said was, oh, women in India are finally learning about violence against women. And it was kind of like, well, actually, feminists in India have been talking about violence against women far longer than you have probably um, since the mid-70s when they created the Forum Against Rape um, and even before that. So uh, even though I did cite a Supreme Court decision as the precipitator for a kind of public agenda, um, feminists had been pushing for legal reform uh, in, in rape and, uh, and in the area of uh, personal law for a long time. So, uh, you know, I, that doesn't really answer your question, but I did just want to add that. Uh, there are definitely, courts are more important in some political systems than others, right? Because in some systems, courts make law, and in other cases, they don't really, right? The Supreme Court or um, court decisions don't have this binding effect of precedence. So Mala and I, this is another thing my co-author and I go back and forth on a lot, because she studies Latin America, and she's like, who cares about courts, you know? Who cares? They don't have the precedent-setting uh, effect. Well, I shouldn't say that she said that. She'll kill me. But, I mean, you know, this is, this is the kind of thing. We, courts are very, play a very different role. So I, you know, I'd be paying careful attention or, or reading decisions and talking about importance of various decisions um, in the United States or in Canada. Um, and she would be saying, yeah, this, this is not the kind of um, way that we study law in Latin America. So it's absolutely the case that the courts are more important in some cases than the other. And that's why um, one of my colleagues has a book called Choosing Where to Fight. That's why activists um, choose the courts as an arena, right, in some cases, right? So you have a feeling for what's the most appropriate arena. Should I go to the court? Should I go to the legislature? Who's more receptive? Is there a political ally who's been elected? Um, did I have a judge appointed who I think is going to change the balance in my favor? Um, you know, should I push for different appointments to the court to try to get the things that I want? So absolutely, courts are more important, and the people who are acting in those contexts are, are mostly aware of that. Um, in exactly the way you suggest. Um. That's sufficiently close to the thing that I was going to okay. ask you that I'm going to ask you. Okay. Uh, one of the things that strikes me as really exciting and innovative about this is that not only are you disaggregating policy outcomes, but you're differentiating kinds of political explanation. They all go into the regression, but according to usual ways of carving things up, autonomous civil society movements and political parties 
and big constitutional macro institutions like an established church mm -hmm. are explanations of different kinds. Right. And it's not common to see somebody working with all of them at the same time. <laughs> it's not common for reasons that might hit you and Mala from two directions. Yeah. Political scientists don't like it because they don't believe in the independence of all of those things. They think one of them is really driving. Right. So they might think, for example, that whether you have left parties or not is really an effect of what's going on in civil society. It's not mm -hmm. a genuinely independent driver. Mm -hmm. From the other direction, it strikes me that activist communities very often get very committed to one explanatory model of political change. Um, one thing that we know this happens about in the cases of gender policy are the, the attachment to the question, how many women are there in the legislature? Mm -hmm. And you do a good job right away of saying, that can't explain variation, but you also don't make much reference to it at all. Right. That doesn't seem to be the master determinant mm -hmm. of everything that happens. Mm -hmm. You're denying that there's a master determinant of everything that happens. Right. Do you worry? Do you worry about those worries from either direction? Do you get those criticisms from either direction? People who are more convinced that there's one thing that has to be the right kind of explanation for all of the different outcomes you look at? I would say that um, on the activist side, for kind of grassroots activists, I've not felt criticism from them about not paying attention to women in government, although I worried about that a little bit. Um, no, they are mostly um, excited to learn um, about what makes difference. And I actually feel like that's an important point to make in general about you know, kind of activism and scholarship, that sometimes people see those things as being incompatible. But I really think that you know, the most committed activists are kind of like people who want to cure cancer. If you want to cure cancer, you're not going to sit there saying, this, you're not going to falsify your data. If you want to cure your mother or father, if you have a personal stake um, in this uh, fight, that's not going to make you um, necessarily pick a worse answer than somebody who doesn't have a stake in the fight. If anything, it might make you more committed to really trying to find the right answer because you care a lot about it. So I don't always think that having a, a dog in the fight means that you're going to be um, biased. Um, and I would say on the question of women in government, the places where that's been, um, I would say, less popular <laughs> as an approach has been um, a couple places you know, where you get invited by more like uh, elite groups that want to promote women in government um, and they want you to talk about that and then um, it's uh, if you're going to say, I, and I'm not, I, I think it's important to have more women elected to government. I'm not against that. I think that's a very important thing, and I think it makes a difference in some cases. I just think it's not the silver bullet that sometimes people think about. And I think that in political science, there are lots of aspects of gender politics to study um, apart from whether women get elected or not. Um, and the things that elected women do, I think there's lots of, a huge range of gender politics that are um, left off the table if that's all we talk about. So I just want us to expand our our field a little bit more, but that sometimes gets heard a little differently um, occasionally. Um, although really I, I would say I haven't had too much trouble on that score. Um, the other way, combining lots of different um, explanations, um, do people uh, criticize us for that? No, I, I, guess, I guess we haven't had that, really. I mean, as you say it, it sounds, it sounds kind of messy the, when, the way you're talking about it. But I guess I think that, um, you know, maybe you take a while for it to emerge in a more kind of coherent form. But there is a kind of coherent um, account uh, that looks at, I think that any good explanation of political outcomes has to involve large-scale macro explanations as well as micro-level accounts of why people do the things they do. So I guess I think it's a strength that we have those things. And, you know, I know it's kind of vague, but going back to the Scotch uh, polity-centered approach in the very beginning of Protecting Mothers and Soldiers where she talks about how you have to think, you know, you have this kind of messy interaction between institutions and identities on the one hand, um, institutions defining the identities of social groups and the kind of way they fit together. In, in a way, that's sort of the approach that we're outlining here where you have, um, you know, major institutional factors that shape things as well as, you know, actors on the ground. And over the long term, of course, they're, they're not independent um, of each other, but in a kind of you know, snapshot way that we're looking at it, you do want to pay attention to both things like who's driving the bus, uh, what are the actions and the political behavior that's taking place here, how do those people understand themselves, what do they think they're doing? You have to, otherwise you can't understand why people are doing the things they're doing. But also, you can't pretend that they're just acting freely. Of course, they're in an institutionalized context where um, norms and uh, patterns of doing things are going to constrain and enable them. And so that's really 
the kind of framework that we're bringing to this particular topic. So you're right that people tend to think of either institutions or social movements uh, often uh, in a kind of a uni, unifactor kind of way, you mono, monological approach, or I don't know, maybe that's the wrong way of calling it, but a one-way approach. And we're really trying to think more about this in a more like kind of rich, interactive uh, framework, I guess I would call it, that takes into account both institutional contexts and the identities of particular actors. So. Great. A few closing announcements before we adjourn and have a reception in the next room. Uh, within the RGCS lecture series, two weeks from tonight, Richard Boyd from Georgetown University will give the next lecture on rights of immigration. That lecture will be in this room. Two weeks after that, Philip Lagasse from the University of Ottawa will give a talk on the separation of powers and the crown in the Canadian Constitution. And that is not in this room. It is, I believe, in McConnell Engineering 280. But again, the rooms can be found uh, in any of the online venues where you presumably found out about this talk in the first place. For the Jan Lin Center, the next event on the schedule is November 5th at the Museum of Fine Arts, where our allied research group, the Research Group on Global Antiquities, will host a lecture by Lothar von Falkenhausen, an art historian at UCLA, on China and the West before the Silk Roots. And the formal inaugural event of the Yan Lin Center for the year, just looking far ahead, will be held April 13th when the Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson will give the inaugural lecture and he is among the leading scholars in the world on the sociology and the history of the idea of freedom and its relationship to practices of slavery. So with that, I hope that you will join us for the reception, and please join me in thanking Laurel Weldon. Thank you. Your great questions and suggestions. <laughs>